So thank you so much, first of all, um, for being here. We appreciate the fact that um, you are interested in fatherhood and all that goes with that. So good morning. We're almost at afternoon, but we starting in, in morning. So I want to thank you all for being here and thank you to our board of directors and our board of trustees, many of whom are here in attendance today for their continued partnership and support of all our programs. We have many programs that occur here at St. Anne's Family Services and we can't do it without your support. I'd also like to acknowledge everyone who made today possible because of, you know, as you know, collaboration is critical on all levels. It's important to our success. And I'd like to thank our programs teams, our catering and conference center team, and our development and events team. Give yourselves a round of applause. Um, Many of you may know that for 115 years, St. Anne's Family Service has primarily focused its attention on women and children. That's who we were and that's what we were about. And more than a decade ago, we took a look at ways that we could incorporate our fathers into the programs. They're a key element of success for our children. So from our community-based services, wraparound services, including mental health and parenting classes, to our early childhood education programs, we know that fatherhood and fathers are a key element to their early success and success throughout life. So because we're always looking at our programs, not only from an intervention standpoint, it's really easy for us to think about, okay, all the interventions that occur as a part of St. Anne's Family Services, but we also want to do prevention. And we feel like incorporating and making sure that fathers are connected with their children um, allows us to create that community with our dads. And our dads are all ages, all backgrounds, all ethnicities, and come to us from different places and at different experiences. And so that's an important um, element. When I began here as the CEO, I vivid, it's so funny, as we started this process, I vividly remember sitting down and having a conversation with some of our leadership and said, I wanna make sure that our organization um, has a strategic approach and focuses on increasing fatherhood and engagement. That was really important. And just to see where we've come, and we know that their presence is important, and we also recognize how challenging it is to, and how challenging it's even become in Los Angeles to be able to provide support for one's family. So when we talk about even the title, when we looked at the cost of fatherhood, you know, there are questions and people like, well, what does that mean? You know, there's the resources, there's the, um, you know, the investment in your child, there's all the pieces around what it takes to be able to successfully be a parent here. We're going to explore all of these things here today. And, you know, we have an esteemed panel of experts in their related fields, and all of who are fathers, because we thought that was important as well. Their insight and experience and their careers have led them to us. I'm very excited to be in conversation with these dynamic gentlemen. I'd like you to please take a moment to uh, join me in welcoming our very dynamic guests. Each one brings a unique perspective of fatherhood and the importance of the role plays in our culture and our community. So please welcome them warmly as they join us here today. The first person we're going to introduce is Dr. Alan Michael Graves. He serves as the senior <laughs> director of teaching and capacity building with the Good Plus Foundation where he focuses on a broad range of multidisciplinary activities from research and program development to training and advocacy for policy change. He's been doing fatherhood work for quite some time. He's in New York City and LA. He has an extensive experience in the human services field as a facilitator, administrator for both public and private agencies. He previously led the Project Fatherhood with the Children's Institute and as a parent of three children, he utilizes both his personal and professional knowledge to strategically and professionally impact the lives of children, families, and communities. Welcome. Thank you. Second, we have Rodrigo Gonzalez. He is the CEO and managing partner of DOD. Yes, we can clap. <laughs> a full service corporate real estate firm 
with clients from around the world. As a member of the Housing Committee for the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, he has a long-standing history of philanthropy, also serving as the national chairman of the board for the Catholic Association for Latino Leadership and a member of the Young Presidents Organization. And he has more. He immigrated from the U.S. From Mex to, the, to the U.S. from Mexico as a child. Rodrigo became a U.S. citizen as a young adult and offers a unique lens highlighting the cultural dynamics that impact fatherhood. He holds a bachelor's degree from the University of California, Irvine, and a master's degree in business administration from Pepperdine University's School of Business and Management. He is also the father of two school-aged children. Now we can clap. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for being here. Ryan Trent serves as the executive vice president of Bolton, a full service, yes, we can clap, a full service insurance and risk management company, having spent, I think your name is on the chair, so look for your name. I can't be bossy to a board member, but just in case. Um, <laughs> Ryan offers a dynamic perspective on the economic factors that impact fatherhood. You know, his whole work and field, his career is to help mitigate risk. So, you know, he's going to bring that great perspective on ep the economics and the factors that impact fatherhood. Having served on our board of trustees for St. Anne's Family Services in 2015 and the board of directors since 2018, Ryan has chaired the St. Anne's Family Services Personnel Committee and the Leadership Advancement Committee, supporting the organization with creating an infrastructure that nurtures talent and keeps the organization thriving. He also serves as the Career Advancement Program Mentor at the USC Marshall School of Business. He is the father of a teenage daughter. As a person with all girls, I feel you. <laughs> so next, welcome. Next. Shaka Senghor is the president and creative director of Shaka Senghor, Inc. Prior, yes, welcome. Prior to launching his media company, he oversaw corporate communications for a public company where he helped shape its strategic evolution in sales and training programs and formulated a robust DEI strategy. He is a former MIT Media Lab Director Fellow and a former fellow in the inaugural class of W.K. Kellogg's Foundation Community Leadership Network. He has won numerous awards and accolades and is a New York Times bestselling author of his memoir, Writing My Wrongs, Life, Death, and Redemption in an American Prison. It's about atonement and a chance for redemption. And Shaka released his book six years after his release from prison. You may have seen him on Oprah's Super Soul Sunday. He also shares the powerful impact of fatherhood and manhood in his book, which is one of my favorite books, I have to say, Letters to the Sons of Society. He is the father of two sons. Welcome. So I am going to join you all over here. So I'm going to make sure everyone has their mic turned on so when we ask questions, we're able to hear you. So fatherhood is a big topic. There's so many elements and areas, and we're going to do our best to have that conversation here today. I'm going to start out with you, Shaka. <laughs> Sorry. Um, as a renowned author and activist, you often speak to the importance of fatherhood masculinity reimagined. How do toxic messages about what it means to be a man negatively impact families and communities? Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having us here. Uh, this is one of those conversations that I have been incredibly excited about having and it really got kicked off energetically when we were back there in the green room and meeting these incredible uh, men who are now on the panel of these fathers as well. 
You know, when I think about, you know, the toxic messaging around Boyhead, I have to go back to my experience of growing up. I'm originally from Detroit, hence the D-hat. Um, <laughs> I live here in L.A. now. And, you know, I, I grew up in a household that on the outside looking in was the model for working class America. My dad was in the Air Force uh, Reserves. He also worked for the state. And my mother was the primary um, homemaker. But within that household, there were high levels of physical abuse and emotional abuse. And I ran away when I was 13 years old, got seduced into um, the crack cocaine trade, where I remained for, um, you know, from, from 13 to 19. And when I got seduced into that culture, I experienced the most toxic forms of masculinity, how to be tough, how to navigate literally life and death situations. And early on, within my first six months, my childhood friend was murdered. I was robbed at gunpoint, and I was beaten her to death. And I remember laying on the, on the bathroom floor um, in, my, in the pool of my own blood as a kid. And I had been beat by these adult men. And I had this question, like, what kind of world do we live in that this is allowed to happen to kids? And what I learned over the years of being within that culture and then, you know, going off to prison where I spent 19 years, seven years in solitary confinement, is that all of the young men I encountered had the same narrative. When something traumatic happens to you, suck it up. Um, you know, you're supposed to navigate this very harrowing environment in the most aggressive way possible. And I see that articulated in our culture. I see it articulated in conversations around relationships. And most importantly, I see it articulated in our conversations about fatherhood, where the idea of what it means to be a father has been unfortunately and sadly and traumatically uh, only infused with the idea of being macho and how tough can you be and how tough and resilient can you make your children. And it's one of the things that inspired me to, to write letters to the sons of society. And as I listen to you, I'm thinking about the fact that, you know, that's all done to build resilience when it actually is doing the opposite. And, and, and us recognizing that work and, and all the evolution that it takes to kind of reprogram that. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. Dr. Graves. Hello. Hi. You've worked tire tirelessly to identify the obstacles and hurdles that fathers face in their journey to become great parents. How can we transform social service systems so that they can incorporate father inclusive approaches to helping families thrive? You know, I'll start with just two words, intentionality and being unapologetic. Being unapologetic is more than one word, right? But, but those are the two things that I'll say, right? We gotta be intentional and unapologetic. You know, I've been working in fatherhood programming and social services for the last 15 years. Uh, I even work with the fatherhood program here, which I'm extremely proud of. Um, but one of the things that I learned early on is that we were providing parents with tools to better parent and then releasing them out into a world that was not father friendly. Right? And so whether it's child support or child welfare or probation or the school district, these were institutions and systems that were not father friendly. And so my, um, since leaving Children's Institute, one of the things that I've been really focused on is providing technical assistance and or training to systems, social service systems, to partner with community base to look at fathers through a different lens. Right? So we can provide parents with all the tools in the world, but if the systems that are receiving them are not ready for them, it's all for nothing. And so the, the, the first and honest answer would be um, partnership amongst the systems. Because I was sharing with somebody backstage, it's okay that you, uh, as a system, you have a service, but if nobody knows about it, and nobody knows to refer this father to it, again, all for nothing. Um, you know I'm a talker, so you gotta stop me. I'm a father of three. And I got to tell you, um, had it not been for my family and or the military, I could have easily been the father in any one of, the, um, of my cases because I was a young father, um, became a single father early on, and I didn't have a father myself, so I didn't know nothing. I didn't know what to do, and I made a lot of mistakes. I actually abused and or neglected my children, and I thought I was doing the damn thing. Right? And it wasn't until I got into spaces and places that helped me um, 
systems that helped me understand what fatherhood looked like through a different lens. A different lens than the one that I saw where my father beat my mom and I thought that was okay. Where, where, where whooping your kids was what we did to keep them safe. Right? I learned something different from a system, a system that was ready to re receive me in all my blackness. Right? That's where I'd like for us to go as we improve systems in father engagement. Intens intentional and unapologetic um, inclusion. Thank you. Intentional and unapologetic inclusion. We will all work towards that. Thank you. Ryan. As the executive vice president of a full service insurance brokerage with expertise in employee benefits, property and casualty risk management, what are some of the economic factors that you think most impact fatherhood? Because, you know, resources, everyone needs them. And there's a level that um, in the community there's expectation of fathers, right. whether it's realistic or not. What do you think some of those factors are? <sighs> You know, I thought about this a lot, and I talked to some friends that um, do not live with their kids full time, and I talked about you know child support and how that works for them, and uh, there's a lot of anxiety behind it, more than just an economic factor. But when you talk about economic factor, let's talk about just the groceries, how much those cost, the insurance for your auto, insurance for your you know renter's insurance, your your even just gas, mm. right? So it creates a lot of anxiety, and yeah, you do have to work multiple jobs, or you have to work late at night, but your kids don't know that. Your kids don't, we, we talked about this in the green room. There's a concept of money. You know, they didn't ask to be here. So as a, as a, as a dad, I always refer to myself as a dad, because I fe feel like father is really a sophisticated word for, <laughs> you know. But, uh, and I always told myself, like, I just want to be a dad, you know. I looked at my dad as a father. Um, but I think it's, no matter how you, you fare on the socioeconomic scale, it's tough. I was looking at a cartoonist um, sketch the other day, and it was a guy in a suit on a park bench like this. And it was a guy in a hoodie not sitting on the park bench, and they both had the same thought. I wish I had more money. And... <clears throat> But when you are on the lower end of the socioeconomic scale, I mean, how do you do it, right? It's the health insurance. And if you, if you have to pay child support, as a man, you have to actually provide the health insurance too. So you have to find a job that, you know, can afford that and get health insurance and, and then try to be there for the kids' sports and growing up. And if you have a daughter, you know, I, I, I feel like somebody told me this a long time ago, 18 months to nine years old is the most important time in a little girl's life for their dad to be involved. Because after nine years old, they kind of have friends and they go out and do their own thing. Um, or you won't get them back. And if you're a young dad, that's the time that you're not making a lot of money. You know, you haven't hit your prime years of, of making money in your 40s and your 50s. So, um, I don't know where I was going with this other than it's just, it's a tough, uh, shake out for for anybody on any type of scale and um, especially living here in Southern California and we were talking about this in the green room four thousand dollars for rent two thousand dollars for rent it's just you know it's tough a lot of anxiety and so those fiscal challenges bring about the mental health challenges right. which we'll talk a little bit about later and so it's important for us to continue to look at how we can improve those resources um, but it starts with awareness, um, and child support is a conversation that has so many layers with that that we'll continue to look at. Rodrigo. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, traditionally, when we think about parenting and fatherhood, there's a sense and a perception and a level of protection that dad brings to the environment. Um, how does your faith impact your beliefs on the importance and the role of the father in today's society? Yeah, thank you, and th thank you for having me. I think it's, it's a little bit uh, nerve-wracking being up here because it assumes like we know what we're doing, um, <laughs> and we don't, and it's, it's a terrifying ordeal with, with the exception of the good doctor. None of us have a plan for it. Right? <laughs> um, I, I prayed about this heading in here because it's, it's such a, an important topic, right? Um, and I think protection and safety and, and, and implementing that into fatherhood are, are very important. I always say that to an extent, 
generational poverty and generational uh, violence carry on generationally because it's normalized at the household. My wife and I, who my wife is here with us today as well, it's so important to also normalize the good stuff, right? Um, I take our kids, most days I take them to school, and I found a YouTube channel that delivers daily mass in 17 minutes sharp. I know it's kind of cheating, but it's a quick mass, right? <laughs> so we listen to mass on, on, a da on a daily basis, and my kids are in the back, and I can kind of hear them repeating, and I say, okay, now it's time for you to ask God for what you're looking for, and, and it's, it's normalizing it. It's diffusing it, right? They may hear otherwise at school. They may hear otherwise in the media, but at home, that's a very normal thing to do. When they hear us pray at the table, they hear us be thankful for some of our wins. They also hear us ask for help with some of our anxieties. So they also, my son, who I am unfairly harder on than with my daughter, because I, I feel the responsibility of raising a man, he hears that it's okay to vocalize, hey, I need help with X, and I need help with Y, or thank you for this, and just show reverence in that way. I think from an extent of how that translates to creating a protective environment, I have mixed feelings. You know, I want my children to feel protected. I came up, in, a, in my childhood, my dad, he wasn't around when I was a kid because he was running a business. He lost the business, and I think he went over to the other side. He, he overcorrected, and that he would leave work early to take us to school or to pick us up, but we were hurting financially. And at that point, I needed, him, I needed more quality over quantity. I needed the times with him to be solid, but I also needed him to provide. And sometimes he didn't. And I think he, I don't know, it's difficult with, with, with parenthood because at, I don't know at what age you can ask your kids for feedback on that, but I think a protective environment, and <laughs> a protective environment with regards to faith requires a dialogue with your kids and requires for you to say, hey son, am I, am I providing you what you need? And my, my daughter and my son need very different things from me. It's interesting. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, you know, sometimes as parents, you, you go one direction, and like you say, he was compensating, making sure, because everyone likes to talk about work-life balance, and what does that look like? You know, is there such a thing? It doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, each child needing something differently is important, too, because you, every child is different, and so having that dialogue. But I think we have to start with communication, something you said about asking your child, you know, what they need. Um, is important, so thank you. Shaka, you document your journey of self-awareness and growth in your book, Letters to the Sons of Society. That evol evolution makes you a different man, therefore a different father, than now, than when you had your son, uh, when you were initially involved with the justice system. Now you have a 10, almost 11, I think you said, year old son, and you're in a different, very different place in your life. You have more social, emotional, financial resources. Share how that impacts your lens on fatherhood. And then also, is that transformation accessible to other fathers and, and, and how you think they could possibly go about that? Uh, thank, thank you so much for asking that question, and I, I don't have to ask my son for feedback. He's consistently like, yo, dad, this is what I need. Um, so there is that, you know, I, I have been, I've been fortunate in, in a lot of ways, you know, despite some of the trauma and the traumatic upbringing, I've always had models of, of fatherhood in different orientations. Um, one of the, the conversations in our family is that all of the men have been present fathers in some capacity. Um, now to which degree that, you know, panned out, it, it varies across um, you know, the, the kind of family. But for me, I was really fortunate that I met some of the most incredible mentors in the world. And, and I have great mentors now. I have incredibly successful people in my life and all the things. But these mentors were men who were serving life sentences. And these men saw something in me that was redeemable when I didn't see it in myself. And just to give context, like I know I'm just up here super chill now and all the things, but I, when I first entered prison, I was so deeply trapped in anger, in anger from disappointment, uh, the sadness, the sense of, you know, not want to be responsible and accountable for my actions. So I got into a lot of trouble. My first five years incarcerated, I accumulated a total of about 36 misconducts. 
Um, and so I was really on a path toward never getting out of prison. And these men would not give up on me. And they challenged me. They were strategic thinkers. They were, they were great strategists. They were master you know, chess players and, and, and brilliant legal minds. And how they found their way in was actually through literature. Um, they started giving me these books by authors like Donald Goins. You know, the books had titles like Black Gangster and Dope Fiend. And, you know, they gave me books by Iceberg Slim, which had titles like Pimp. And so it appealed to where I was at that stage of my life. And what these guys and their brilliant wisdom knew is that those books would run out. And that's when they gave me Malcolm X's autobiography, which I believe is one of the most transformative stories in American culture. And when I read that book, what it did for me is it showed me that anything was possible. And how you start today does not mean you have to end that way tomorrow. And so how that shows up as, as a father is that I have a 32-year-old son who was born six months after my arrest. My dad intervened in that relationship and did his best to raise him. And unfortunately, my older son navigates uh, mental health uh, issues. When I left out of prison, I came home with this very ambitious idea. I thought, okay, I'm going to get home. He's 19 years old now. Me and him, we're going to build businesses. We're going to ride off to the sunset. I'll be the super cool dad with fly sneakers and, you know, look relatively young at that time. Uh, clearly, this 13 years was taking its toll. Um, <laughs> and, and it didn't pan out that way. You know, I ran into a version of all the young men I had saw in prison. And I was nervous about that, and I wanted to protect him, and I wanted to make sure that he didn't make the decisions that I made. And what I realized is that I came home as a mentor and not a father. And so what, how that shows up now, and with, with Sekou, my youngest boy, is that I practice what's called egoless parenting. You know, I do not insert my ego into his outcomes. You know, what I believe is that we're all on this human journey, um, that we will eventually get to a point that we have to navigate and figure out what we want our life outcomes to be. My responsibility at this point is to provide uh, some type of kind of structure for him to exist autonomously within. Um, and, and what that looks like is, you know, there's a, there's a scaffolding there. You know, there's tons of wisdom that comes from wrecking my childhood. And so he can access that through real communication. We have deep conversations. And, you know, when you talk to him, you're like, yo, am I really talking to, you know, a little 11 year old? Because we, from the very beginning, opened up this two way dialogue. And so, you know, egoless parenting has really allowed me to create space for him to grow and evolve into whatever kind of human being he wants to. And it's not easy as a dad when you have all these social pressures as the dads on here talked about, you think about the economic pressures, and it's not just coming from fatherhood, it's coming from the idea of what it means to be a man. Um, our value has only been limited to our ability to protect and to provide. No one talks about our ability to nurture. No one talks about our ability to educate. Nobody talks about our ability to enlighten. But when you hear these men and they're talking about this transformative journey that they've been on and having spiritual practice in the car, we don't, we don't see that narrative. Um, you know, when, when my son is, is sick, um, I miss comfort. You know, I'm fixing that soup. I'm staying up at 3 in the morning and making sure that he's comforted. And so I think part of it for me is that I had to embrace a new way of seeing what it means to be a man. And I came about it in this very simple way, and I'll wrap up here. I was working in the law library, and somebody sent a box of books called Houses of Healing. I started reading the book, and it blew my mind how, um, how deeply it touched me as a human being and that the little boy inside of me had never been nurtured. I asked the law librarian, can we start a class? I'm thinking maybe two or three guys will show up. First time, it was six guys. Second class, it was at capacity. And there was a room full of men who were serving long sentences, and they were crying and they were hugging, and they were hugging the little boy inside of each other. And that's when I knew that whatever I do as a dad, I will not traumatize my child, I will not stifle that little boy that is deserving of joy, and it won't be attached to how much money I make. It'll be attached to how I spend the time 
that I have with them. And that's how I focus. Like now, and, and, it, and, and like most parents, you get it. You buy your, toy, your kid an expensive toy. It's the first thing they do. They discard the toy and play with the box. <laughs> so that's the ego that we have. We feel like we have to buy the thing. And in reality, they just want that time they were spent, you know, with you. And so that's how I try to show up as a father. Egoless parenting. Yeah, that's, I, I like that. Egoless as a human being is challenging. So definitely it's work that can be done. Um, and yes, we remember all buying those toys and they play with the box. But thank you for sharing that wisdom. Absolutely. So as we move along, you know we do a lot of work with our um, you know, fathers that are involved with our program, and we're gonna look at that in a little while. But before that, you know, Rodrigo, you talked about um, you know, having immigrated to the US from Mexico as a child and subsequently gaining citizenship. You know, when people hear that, they're like, oh, you represent what is called the American dream and the power of that dream. What are some of the cultural dynamics that shape fatherhood, especially as it relates to the Latino community? Yeah, thank you. Um, I became a citizen at 30. I was undocumented through 21. So just navigating that was interesting. Um, there's, a, there's a, a large amount of pride in providing, right? There's a large amount of pride in being able to say, you know, like you equate the number of hours that you're out there grinding to the level of, to the amount of love that you exert to your family, right? To an extent, it's, it's a lot of work to live in LA. It's a lot of work to live in LA when you're undocumented and you don't, you don't speak the language. And I think that there's no clear answer as to how to have a work-life balance and be out there grinding and then coming home and being the best father you can. I think my opinion has always been is that I need to make sure my kids' need, basic needs are met. I need to make sure that our family is in a, in a good position. And I also need to understand that there's trade-offs with that. There's sacrifices with that. There are sacrifices that maybe I may miss some things but it, it, it places the responsibility of quality over quantity on my shoulders, right? I think that growing up, a lot of, a lot of the friends that we had, a lot of the, a lot of the folks around me, with their kids, their parents were also immigrants and they were out there grinding and working and, and just working multiple jobs and they wouldn't see their parents, then they would get a, par a tired parent coming home. I get it, right? There's a trade-off. I have, I, it led me to think, hey, listen, I need to implement things where I'm forced to be present, right? We, my wife and I have launched our businesses and whatnot, and I always volunteer to coach for, one of, for each one of my kids in one capacity or another. And I complain all the time about it. And I complain to my wife about her schedule all the time. But you know what? It forces me to coach to be there, to be present, to pick them up, that they see me being an involved parent. It may mean that that day I'm working till 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, but I, it's scheduled and I force myself to it. I think a Latino father, to an extent, needs to forgive himself for the amount of work that he has to do to kind of raise a family out here, but he also needs to be present that the few minutes that he does have with his children are priceless, right? Priceless, like, and, that's, and that's something that's very present to me. You know. Thank you, that's powerful. And I was thinking about what you were saying and thinking about what Shaka was saying about, you know, to provide and protect, but what about nurturing, educating, and all those other pieces. And, you know, we'll talk as we go down the line about, you know, gender roles in terms of what's changing and some of the, the positive aspects of that for fatherhood. But thank you for that. Ryan, you've been a part of our board and dedicated your time talent and resources to St. Anne's Family Services due to your belief in the work that we do that impacts the lives of children and families. You've come here with your teen daughter to volunteer, which has been exciting to meet her and see you two working in the pantry. How important is it to model and inspire philanthropy as we you know, work as a parent, as a father for your children? I think it's huge. You know. <clears throat> Um, I'm a late blooming Catholic. I went to the RCIA program. My daughter uh, was baptized, and I said I didn't want to be a hypocrite, so I wanted to see what you know the Catholic religion was all about. And 
it, it brought two things. One, it brought perspective. The other thing it brought was the, the culture of giving back. And she's been in Catholic school her entire, you know, school life so far. And that's all they've been, you know, they, they teach giving back. They go to St. Francis. They do all these different things that they, you know, they're well aware that they're in a privileged life. Um, when it comes to bringing her here, I just think it's very impactful because I've been involved since she was born. Um, she's heard some of the stories of early on when I started volunteering here. And she's well aware that she has it, you know, quite frankly, better than most. And especially here. And so anything that she could do to give back, and I, as she gets older, I'm hoping when she gets into high school and even older than that, she's going to continue to come back here and continue to um, give her time. And uh, whether it's rearranging the pantry or, you know, doing, you know, vacuuming up, she's, you know, we're very lucky. She's a good kid. She understands that um, not everybody is equal in a sense of, you know, what they have at their disposal, resources, things of that nature. So, very blessed in that regard. Thank you. And philanthropy is something that is important to, to teach all our young people because giving back in that spirit of gratitude helps us in our journey. Um, so, I would like just to take a quick moment for you to please turn your attention if you're facing this way, the screen behind you, and if you're up here, I guess the screen here, um, one of our fathers, uh, a video that will be shown of Mr. Raul Fajardo, one of our um, very own fatherhood program participants. His children attend our early childhood education program, and he wanted to share his thoughts um, on the work that's been done with him here through St. Anne's Family Services. And we have subtitles on there for, um, he is speaking to us in um, his primary language, which is Spanish. Saluditos a todos, como están? Eh, una de mis cosas favoritas como padre es, uh, es saber de que cuando llego a casa, en verdad, mis hijos me están esperando eh, con su brazo abierto para darme amor, para darme cariño y para que ellos se sientan seguros, ¿verdad? Porque está su padre a la par de ellos. Eh, la verdad que es una experiencia hermosa, el cual Dios me ha dado y me ha permitido, ¿verdad? Ser padre. Y pues la verdad, agradezco a Dios por ello, porque me ha dado unos excelentes hijos. Y pues... El, el, al ver la alegría verdad en los rostros de mis hijos pues me impulsa me, me motivo para seguir adelante luchando luchando para darle lo mejor a ellos y la verdad que me enfrento a, a un desafío muy grande como padre y pues lo único que yo como padre Tengo el deber y la responsabilidad de enseñarles a mis hijos a, a defenderse por ellos mismos, ¿verdad? Siempre con educación, eh, siempre haciendo lo recto, siempre haciendo lo correcto, ¿verdad? Como un buen ciudadano. Enseñarles a ellos modales para que ellos sean personas de bien el día de mañana. Y la verdad que pues lamentablemente, ¿verdad? Eh, hemos pasado, tanto yo como, como mi familia, eh, hemos pasado experiencias, la verdad, muy malas, ¿verdad? Y pues mi deber es de darle a ellos mi apoyo, darle a ellos mi confianza, darle a ellos mi seguridad para que ellos se sientan protegidos porque realmente cuando usted tiene a su padre de su lado eh, los hijos lo ven a usted como un superman como, lo ven a usted como un uh, como que nadie les puede hacer frente verdad y esa es la seguridad de que yo quiero darle a mis hijos 
que ellos se sientan tranquilos, que ellos se sientan seguros, verdad, de que yo estoy con ellos y que yo voy a esforzarme el día a día a darle lo mejor a mis hijos. De la familia de servicio de Saint Anne's, la verdad que nos ha ayudado ya bastante. Eh, este programa para nosotros ha sido una bendición. Hemos estado en este programa por más de ocho años y realmente nos hemos benefici beneficiado bastante, tanto en corto como en largo plazo. Y no solo nosotros, sino también nuestros hijos han sido beneficiados, ¿verdad? Y han, ellos han tenido... ¿verdad? un rendimiento académico bastante grande, bastante eh, satisfactorio, gracias a este programa, Saint Nance, les agradecemos de todo corazón, eh, y realmente, pues, si hablamos de los, de los eventos que Saint Nance ha tenido, realmente han sido de mucha bendición para nosotros, yo como padre he podido ver verdad la alegría en los rostros de mis hijos he podido ver de que se sienten felices contentos y la verdad que Seinans muchas gracias por tomarnos en cuenta a nosotros los padres eh, del poder participar en sus eventos en sus programas I don't know if he's here. I believe I hear. Oh, can you stand up and just be recognized? Thank you. I wasn't sure if you were here, but thank you so much for sharing those words. Muchas gracias. What I have to say before I go to my next question or point, it's so funny because as this video was being recorded, I hadn't seen it. And I was preparing you know, some thoughts and some questions. And a lot of what we were talking about, the protection, the provision, and, and then I saw the video afterwards, and it just like hit me. This is real. What we're talking about, here's someone sharing their um, feedback, and, and, and it's all the other elements. He talked about the education and the nurture, some of those pieces. But that's a part of fatherhood, this, this element of protection, and I wanna talk about something that connects with what he shared, but also where we are as a society and what's happening in our community. So, you know, a recent Pew Research Center study found that black and Latino parents are more likely than white and Asian parents to say that they are extremely or very worried about their children being shot or getting into serious trouble. How does this heavy mental load make it difficult for fathers in marginalized communities to feel that they can keep their children safe and feel adequate as a parent. Now I'm gonna start with Shaka and Rodrigo for this question and then we'll continue on. Wow, that's a, um, that's a really tough question and you know, hearing, thank you again for your story. It just really, you know, brings home the conversation we're having. When I think about gun violence in our community, you know, obviously I have to go back to where I grew up at, which is in the city of Detroit, that at one time was considered a murder capital for multiple years running. But one of the most heartbreaking experiences that I reflect back on is to seeing my dad standing over my bedside after I got shot when I was 17 years old. And my dad, you know, he had this, this look on his face that I, I never forgot and I was, I was angry with him for a long time because my dad had the look of helplessness and like it was nothing he can do. But you know, the wisdom of when I reflect back I get it because I was the third of his sons that had been shot. Uh, within our family, there have been 10 victims of gun violence. 
Um, and many of us went on to perpetrate gun violence. So it's a very traumatic cycle, you know, of PTSD. And, you know, so when I think about that protective desire to make sure that your child can navigate, you know, the world without being harmed, it can be very hard when you've had high levels of gun violence that impacted you personally and, you know, within your family. And, I, you know, I think for me, um, sometimes I just try not to think about it. You know, and it's, 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 it's sad, I'll just be like, man, you know, he has his own walk. You know, he doesn't come up like I came up and, you know, I provided, which goes back to that word, of a, a different environment for him to be nurtured and grown in, but it's still, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's still present. You know, it's not at the volume that it was where I grew up at. And, you know, for me, I, I believe this, and I'm sure, you know, I, I can see from these men here, I believe once you are a father, you are a father to all the children that are in your presence. And so I have mentees who are growing up in tougher environments and I worry about, you know, getting that call at two in the morning and I think about it often. Uh, in the city where I come from, where you're still seeing high levels of gun violence. My fiance, she's uh, from the south side of Chicago and her work is still there. And, you know, monthly, we get calls of a young boy killed. And, you know, I don't know how much y'all know about the Midwest, but the, the level of violence there is like unbelievable. It's really a human rights crisis, a humanitarian crisis. Uh, I think there were 700 murders in Chicago last year and about 400 in Detroit, which has a smaller population. Um, so it's, it's part of what we've really grown up with. And, you know, as a dad, like I say, I think about those kids and it makes me double down on my work in violence prevention and really to work with young men on these inarticulated, you know, emotions that leads to these violent outcomes. You know, if you, you, you think about all that we've, we've we talk so much about protection and provision and the stressors that that adds to our lives. And when you're, you know, that leads to being short tempered, um, you know, growing up how we grew up where physical acts of violence against our young bodies was a norm. You know, we called spankings, beatings, whoopings, whatever language we have for it. We learned very early on, that's how you resolve frustration. And so now you're dealing with economic needs, you're dealing with social needs, and then you can't articulate that, it tends to manifest in these very volatile ways. And so what I would say, I'm a very solution-oriented person, is one, we have to call a thing what it is. PTSD is a real thing in our community. Hurt people hurt people. The cycle of violence we see is an articulation and expression of that. And then we have to think about where and how can we reach people. Uh, volunteering or going to jails, going into the prisons, really sitting with people who have actually committed acts of violence. And you'll begin to better understand what is the triggers amongst the gun violence and we can come up with better solutions. And this is, you know, I, I share my work all around the world. Um, I was a perpetrator of gun violence. And, you know, I tragically caused a man's death when I was 19 years old, you know, and it's one of those things that I share with young people because that's the lifelong sentence. The prison sentence isn't the lifelong sentence. It's the reality that, you know, you can do a lot of things in life, but you can't restore someone's life once taken. And so I try to, you know, really spend time with fathers and sons um, and share that story, you know, as painful as it can be sometimes, because I would never want somebody to live with that for the rest of their lives. And so, you know, I think we are, we're at crisis level and we've been that way for a long time. You know, it can be frustrating to see the national reaction when there's a mass shooting. And I'm like, dude, 15 people got shot in Chicago last weekend. You know, and so, you know, as a black man in America where, you know, we suffer from the highest gun related mortality rate, you know, it's, it's not that I can't be empathetic when those things happen. It's just that I got a gut check that's real. And I think that's the same for, for my brown brothers and sisters, so. Thank you, it's powerful. Yeah. Thank you, Shaka, for sharing that. Um, this question made me think a lot uh, because part of me thought, well, I don't, I don't think I don't know if I have those fears, but then I started really thinking about it and praying about it, and it's really interesting. 
I, I don't like hoodies. I hate them. My wife knows that I don't like my kids to wear them. My son has to go out with his shirt tucked in all the time. Um, when we're out and about, like when we go to Valle de Guadalupe or Baja and we're crossing back on the border with, in terms of with authority around, my, my wife's joking around, I get so tense and nervous at the border because I know what I could lose, right? Where I grew up, to a lesser extent, once you see something or you see a violence or you go to a friend's funeral or something, you know that there's some realities that people don't think are there that you know are. People are capable of a lot. And I thought about this question from a standpoint of, number one, it makes me nervous with my son as he gets older, who's he surrounding himself with? Because you kind of, you have like a little porcelain doll that you're giving out to the world, right? And what happens there is it's in God's hands. But for me, I thought about, well, number one, am I projecting my fears on him? And am I breaking that seal for him, right? My wife does a very good job of protecting our children and keeping them in a very happy place all the time. And sometimes I step in when there's nothing there and I say, watch out for this, be careful with that because I know what they're capable of, right? Because we've seen it, unfortunately. And nothing happens and I just created anxiety for them for no reason. But at the same time, I need to make them aware that it could. For us, that's just, it could, it could happen. So it's a fine line, and it's a, I struggle with it all the time. But yeah, to this day, I'm at the border, and my wife cracks jokes, and I'm like, hey, they may pull off the citizenship. Hey, I, I don't know if it's forever, so don't joke around. But, <laughs> you know. That's, it's, but in, in, and just to clarify, because I always like when we talk about things people hear, when you say you don't like hoodies, you don't like them, you don't like them worn, it's based on from a fear base. Yeah, because it's not I, about who's in them. It's about you know, f seeing and knowing the potential of what can happen yeah, for your child. They mean nothing. They mean nothing. It's, yes. they're, it's clothing. Yes. But, I, but I tell them I don't want them to be miscategorized or mistaken or anything along, along those lines. Mm -hmm. Only for that reason. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you, you, Dr. Grave, I, I had another question for you, but I, I see you rocking. I'm wondering, like, you look like you want to possibly jump in on, on this before the next question. So, we're, no, but but that's all right. As long we're still good on time, so go ahead and, and lean into the rock. <laughs> yes. So I want to start with the cost of fatherhood. I don't know who came up with that, but when I first saw it, I'm like. This is it, the cost of fatherhood, because it goes into some things that are, uh, several of us have said, right? In addition to the finances, Outside. I'm going to um, just start with a quick story just about my, my nine-year-old son. I'm a scout master, and um, we do a lot of volunteer work in my, my Boy Scout troop. I have about 40 boys here in this area. Um, the scout center is right up the street, we, and we do a lot of work with the homeless. And my son said to me recently, Daddy, can I ask you a question without you getting mad? <laughs> I said, go ahead. He said, well, we do all this work with the homeless, and, and you keep screaming about how much you care and how passionate you are with the homeless. We live in a big old house, and only two of the four rooms are occupied. Why don't you let one of these homeless people stay in our house? <laughs> now, we laugh, but... I have to be the person to explain to a nine-year-old who I've been telling them homelessness is something that we have to be caring about, da 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 There's a cost to the father, being the father. Oh, I'm sorry, I done stood up in my seat, y'all. <laughs> and, and it goes beyond the, the, the dollar sign in the thing, right? We talked about provider. Now, I gotta tell you, I'm a little old school, and for a long time, provider has mean roof over your head, clothes on your back, and food in your mouth. But ever since George Floyd and a lot of those things that went on, you guys, my, my definition of provider has changed. Today, I'm a provider of keeping my two adult sons alive. Yep. I'm a provider of explaining racism and homelessness and this, this war that we're going through right now to a nine-year-old who doesn't get it. That's providing to me. So when I work with systems and social work, we got to redefine what the role of father, what the cost of fatherhood is, and sometimes it ain't tied to my job. Now, I know we need money to take care of our kids. I'm, I'm, I, I got you, right? But the cost of fatherhood goes beyond the dollar sign, right? You, 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 my, two, my son, I'm so glad that you, you said that because my sons get mad at me because I do not allow them to wear hoodies. I associate it with somebody seeing you as somebody else and my baby 
my baby, y'all, I got 30-year-old, a 28-year-old, and I told them, don't judge me, I got a nine-year-old, right? <laughs> but my babies losing their lives behind a shirt. So, I, you know, I see hoodies all the time. They, they own them, wear them in the house, wear them when it gets chilly, but when we go outside, you can't wear them. That's part of be the cost of my fatherhood, right? I have to balance those conversations with my son when their friends get to, right? I, um, the last thing I'll say around um, the, for me, the, the cost of the fatherhood is my, the, the conversation you had around masculinity, right? And showing up how I do, right? There is a cost to, I tell people all the time, it's what, 12 o'clock? I've worn probably 17 masks already today. I'm not talking about COVID masks. I'm talking about societal masks. I show up with, a, I have to put on a mask with my kids. I put on another mask with my neighbors. I put on another mask when I went to the grocery store before I came here. At another meeting, I wore another mask too. When I leave here, I'll probably wear three or four. That gets tiring. There's a cost to that. And it's ingrained in my fatherhood. I have to show my sons that I'm a provider, I'm a man. But I also have to teach them that it's okay to cry. I have to teach my sons that because in my, my culture, in the African-American culture, you were soft if you was walking around crying. We need to establish that there is still a, um, um, a, a societal norm around what manhood looks like. I'm going to stop because I see you you going, no, I'm going no, to my no. next question. I, I appreciate okay. everything you're saying. Um, I do because it, it's, every one of you have alluded to this and how we define manhood defines fatherhood so it is important to explore that and nurturing is a part of um, you know fatherhood you know when you think about the cost you know costs come with there's an investment you know if, if you're if you're buying something spending on something there's an intention to why you're getting that and there's that level of so what we're talking about yeah no it's not just provision and resource it's investing in our children and the outcome we want is life health safety, wellness, joy. One of the things that I loved in the video was joy. You want children to have a level of joy. They're too young to be burdened with the levels of concerns, but we also have to make them aware, like you said, Rodrigo, you, you want everything to be happy, your wife is capable of you know, bringing that joy, but just around the corner, you, you don't wanna give the fear, but you also wanna be, have them be aware. So it's that fine line. Now, Dr. Graves, the question was for you, so I'm back to you again, but I wanted to allow you to express. Um, how has the work that you've done to equip fathers and those who work to empower and uplift them impacted the next generation of fathers? And what are some practical things that we can do to make the most impact? Because we wanna make sure people leave here today and those who will see this video afterwards have some tips and tools on, on things that can be helpful. Just repeat the first part of the Yes, I will go back. So how has the work that you have done to equip fathers and those you work with to help empower and uplift them impacted the next generation of fathers? So the impact your work has had on fathers and then share some of those tips basically. Most of the fathers that I work with have had some type of systems involvement, right? Um, and I think the most impactful thing that I've been able to do through the collaborations and partnerships that we've had is to um, articulate that I have to meet you where you are. That's a buzzword. Everybody's heard it. Meet people where they are. No. Meet them where they are, but don't leave them there, right? Yes. That part. Meet them where they are, but don't leave them there. I work with fathers and are able to articulate that you can't be a nurturing father, Rodrigo, unless you're a nurturing man. Ooh. So that means I need, Rodrigo might need to work on himself because he's breaking some cultural norms and some societal norms. I have to know that, Alan Michael, it's okay for me to be who I am in order to be the nurturing dad for my children, right? And the men that I work with, they come back all the time and say, you know, I've gotten to a point where I'm less concerned about what Jaku says about what fatherhood looks like and the, pro the focus is on me and my children. So that means they have to focus on their self, self care. That means that I have to have a focus on mental health. That means I have to have a good relationship with the mother of my children, right? A lot of people don't know, and most of the fatherhood work that we're doing right now, we talk about 
Because I'm not a, a fatherhood advocate. I've convinced them that it's the priority is their children. I'm a child advocate. I work with fathers to improve the outcomes of kids. And getting a father to understand this ain't about you, guy. This is about your children. So yes, you and the mother of the children might have some, some challenges, but this is about you showing up for your children. And when they get that, they're like, Dr. Graves, I'm so appreciative because I run the parenting groups, right? One of the, the groups where we get together and talk about this all the time. And they'll come back and say, for most of my life, it's been about me. Now I understand that the priority needs to be about my kid, however, what, and whatever avenue that looks to. So again, um, some, some takeaways for that, intentional engagement. Let's not avoid the uncomfortable conversations. We need to talk about race. I love when working with social workers. And, oh, I don't, I'm, I, I don't um, care about race. It's not about race. I see everybody. I say, you can't help me then. If you can't see that I'm 6'2", 227, I lost three pounds, y'all. <laughs> if you can't see that I'm this big old black man, then you can't help me. So we have to have in our systems and our programs some real uncomfortable conversations, right? I, I need to be able to talk about what the plight of a Latino man is as, as, as it pertains to immigration today, right? Because it wasn't my journey, but I need to know with someone who has 85% of Latino clients, I need to know that that's real. And how does that show up in my work, right? So I've, I've gotten fathers to take away that this ain't about me, it's about my children, and I'm going to utilize tools to make my, the outcomes for my kids better. I know that was a long-winded response, but I hope No, but it was I great. It. Yeah. Information we needed to hear. I love your passion. So I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep moving, but I'm going to um, ask, um, you know, Anyone here, Shaka, anyone here who has experienced co-parenting can answer. In a perfect scenario, successful co-parenting involves collaboration regarding visitation, education, health, and extracurricular activities and more. What advice would you share for fathers who are not as fortunate to have the compromise and mutual respect when it comes to the partner or the mother of their child. So, you know, the relationship may not be one where you see eye to eye, and it's not about asking about your relationship, just to clarify. If anyone has experience around that, how do you go about um, giving advice as a father in that scenario to go back to what you just said in the best interest of doing it for the child? So. Chuck, I don't know if you would like oh, to sure. start. Um, so, uh, it, you know, earlier when I talked about egoless parenting, it was not related just to the rearing of Sekou. It was also related to my relationship with his mother. Mm. And co-parenting is, can be extremely challenging for all the different reasons. I think that one of the things that I think we did have an advantage as that we had Sekou when we were both a little bit older, a little bit more mature, and we also had our own background experience of our parents not getting it right um, and in a lot of ways and then some of the ways that they did get it right but it's it is the it is the biggest and especially for dads and I'm sure mothers have their own experience that's unique when I when I think about just the conversation we've had today no matter how far we move the ball down the field when it comes to emotional nurturing all the things we literally take it 20 yards back to protection provision, protection provision. And, you know, when I, when I think about how I have showed the best, it's usually when I am in the best iteration of myself emotionally. And what that looks like is, is dads have to start creating space for authentic self-care. That is so important. You have to take that time and not just the time you sit in the car to gather yourself before you come in the house. You have to really take the time, not just Sunday football, when you're lucky if you can duck off without somebody distracting you while the game's going, um, but real time to recalibrate emotionally, um, to feel deeply. You know, love, love is more than just, did I make them feel safe? Uh, joy is one of the greatest gifts that fathers have been denying themselves. The ability to have unbridled joy. And when you're co-parenting, that can be very complex. Um, because sometimes the other parent can be adversarial 
And the thing that they hate to see you have more than anything is joy. Um, and so, you know, for me, what I would say is communication, checking the ego, not pers even if the other parent is being in a, 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 a adversarial posture, center it back on the need of your child and a need for your own sense of well-being. You know, I cannot be the best father possible if I am allowing myself to be emotionally impacted by a disagreement with his mother. You know, and so for me, I try to see her authentically as this is the greatest accomplice that I will ever have in rearing this boy and getting him through life. And I never move off that. I can be irritated with her, I can be annoyed, I can be all the different things. I know at the end of the day, this woman loves this little boy as much if not more than I do. And so I lean into that, like that's what allows me to check my ego is like, I know she loves him. And I know that she is an advocate for him. And even though she's annoyed that I got a new partner and all the things, I always wrap it back around to what is she doing as a parent to ensure that he has the best passage through life? And how am I showing up first in joy? How am I showing up in full of wellness uh, in my own being so that I can actually be a great co-parent? and that we can talk about what is our responsibilities, what is our duties. Um, you know, it requires removing a lot of those layers about what it means to be a man. You know, I was a single dad for a long time, and, and I actually enjoyed it a lot. Um, <laughs> but with, within, that, within that enjoyment, it was, I have all of these responsibilities when he's with me, and it's a very equitable split of time. You know, so I couldn't call him and be like, yo, his laundry. It's like, no, I actually do his laundry. And I found the deepest sense of connection through those small things. You know, he's in bed and I'm folding up these little t-shirts and I would just get like so emotional, you know, and, and the emotion was around. I've been gifted with the opportunity to shepherd a young life through the world. And what a great opportunity that is. And like those small things to me are what subdues the ego and it helps me step out of, you know, anything that's confrontational or that's going to be harmful to him. Um, and so that's, for me, it's like, check the ego. Also make sure that you're taking care of yourself. Like, I, I really encourage every dad in here to be intentional about self-care and things that really bring you joy. I mean, like, deep joy, not just satisfaction because your team won, but what actually brings you deep joy, and I guarantee you'll be able to show up as a father in a whole new light and as a co-parent. Thank you. Self-care, ego, all those powerful things that often, you know, dads don't have the opportunity and joy. We want to see our children have joy. Thank you. Anyone else like to answer that before we move on? And I would just add one thing is, and I love how family, um, St. Anne said family services, right? Because my job is to work with families, but it means to include the dad, right? The whole family. I work with fathers to, and articulate to them that children need both parents. Mm -hmm. They need their mother and they need their father. And, and, and sir, um, you need to work with this parent to move the outcomes. Do you know what happens, what the stats are that say when the dad or the mom's not involved and there's data for both, right? But a, and, and I work with a lot of fathers like I don't she, my son has me he doesn't need her uh-uh children will tell you they love their mamas right and so you got to respect his mother and honor his mother and so I'm on this um, co-parenting kick nationally right now that you might not be able to co-parent right you might not but maybe you parallel parent mm. That means that the two of you are working together alongside each other for the benefit of the kids. Y'all, some people just say, to be honest with you, we're not gonna like each other. We're not, we can't have civil conversations, but we can parallel parent mm. to the goal of having positive outcomes from our kids. Thank you. New term, parallel parenting. Thank you. We wanna share knowledge here today. <laughs> so um, as we're conscious of time, I also wanna ask, you know, you talked about folding the clothes and, and those special moments. And you know what I love is when I see a lot of the young dads now taking that, 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 that primary, you know, the feeding, all the things that at some point in time was seen as something that would be a mother doing that, those gender roles. Ryan, talk to me a little bit about the thought, your thoughts about the changing 
um, gender role strategies? Uh, I don't really have a choice in my house. My wife tells me what to do, <laughs> full disclosure. Uh, that's why I'm here right now. She said I had, no, I'm kidding. Uh, as much as I don't know what it's like to be a man of color or a person of color, mm -hmm. I also don't know what it's like to be a woman, mm -hmm. born female, mm -hmm. um, in a world where we're hearing statistics all the time about, you know, for every three graduates of college, two are women now. For every six valedictorians, four are women now. But we're also hearing women's rights are being taken away. Um, yesterday I was just sharing with this, as if my nightmare uh, was my daughter was home free of school for the day after Halloween, which I wish I had growing up. Um, <laughs> and she was coming back from down the street and we have a pretty um, busy street, but pretty safe. And a creep drove by and asked her to get in the car. And she ran back the other way. She came home and our neighbor brought her, brought her home and she's like, I just thought you'd be more mad. I said, mad? It's like my nightmare. It's scary. Um, I think one of the things that I've had to be more aware of is my vulnerability with my daughter, where, yes, I'm tough, but I, she knows she has me wrapped around her finger, but <clears throat> I have to be conscious of the fact that I don't know what to do sometimes, right? When she, and that's why I have a, you know, a wife who tells me, hey, back off, she just started her you know what, and I went, oh. <laughs> Okay, and I had two sisters, so I thought I was a pro. I was like, oh, I've seen these things all over the bathrooms before. Uh, but then when it's your daughter, you know, you just have to be more conscious of the fact that you have to be more in tune with, with you have to fit into their lives more than they have to fit into your life. Um, and we talked about this backstage. If I had a son, I'd probably be tougher on him, right? Just like Rodrigo said about being tougher on his son and his daughter. Um, and I was telling a, a friend of mine who is in a squabble with his um, kid's mom, and, she, and she's 13, and I said, you need, to go, you need to be vulnerable, you need to go to her, and you need to say, I don't know what I'm doing, and I need your coaching, I need help. Um, and that's going to help you better, whether it's co-parenting or parenting in a parallel universe or whatever you said, but that was great. I will get that down Parallel parenting. Uh, and I'm going to go home and say, we don't have to be co parent we just pay sheets and, um, but anyway, yeah, I, I think we just, as far as like changing, it's sharing the role. It's not, you know, even though my wife, um, doesn't have a paying job, she's got a big job and she lets me know that she's not going to do that alone. And um, she's here to support me, and I'm here to support her. And that's, that's where I leave that. Thank you. And she would say she just doesn't work outside the home. That's right. She works in the No, home. she's going to say she does all the work. Yes, yes, yes. So I, you know, want to ask all of you this question. And some of it, some of, you've answered some of this to a certain degree, so don't feel the need to expound be you know beyond but i think it's important so you shared a lot of incredible things i think that might have been my timer um but we recognized that one of the reasons where we came up with the cost of fatherhood and the conversation is being in an uh, environment that is so incredibly expensive you know in terms of you know keeping the roof over your head, the food, the gas costs, all those amazing things that you know everyone tells me since I moved to the from the East Coast that you're pay, we're paying for the weather, we're paying for the weather, and the weather is beautiful, but there is that economic impact, and when you think about parenting is difficult enough. In a recent report by the California Department of Housing revealed that a single person household in LA is considered low income at about 70,000 a year, with a four person household having a limit of around $100,000 a year. Think about that. With the win minimum wage being set at around $15.50 per hour, it is going up in January, um, I believe, another 55 cents. But many Angelinos are li living far below the poverty line. You know, 
what are the challenges father face, fathers face in light of these startling economic facts? And as you talk about, you know, those quality moments, Rodrigo, you know, making those difficult decisions, but if, if spending time and engagement with your child is key to success, but then someone has to work the two and three jobs just to pay rent and per, pay, purchase basic necessities, that work-life balance is a constant conflict. You know, there are parents who tell their children, I show you love based on keeping that roof over your head, keeping those lights on, putting food on the table. And we've talked a little bit about how we can kind of shape that a little different around the nurturing, but just how does living in this very beautiful but expensive environment change the ability for a, a parent to have that level of sustainability? And we talked about it a little bit, but I'd just like your thoughts on, you know, what would you say to someone who's like, I'm trying to do all of these things and I'm feeling like I'm failing at both sides, the work, the support. So I would just throw it out there that we have to, again, meet them where they are, because I know a whole lot of poor people that are happier than I am, that are better parents than I am, right? So mm -hmm. it, the, the, it's not really tied to the money, but we need money to parent, right? My kids love their little school, they love the piano, they love the, so, so those things come with a cost. But if that doesn't work for my family, that doesn't get to determine my fatherhood, right? I worry a lot of people, if there's no safety issue with the child and they're struggling and they're happy, let them struggle. That's their, we meet them where they are. Although we do need to provide resources, employment, um, housing for those, those people who are not meeting the needs, right? And as a system, and systems, I think that's where we need to, to partner so that we, we establish those resources to allow people to be in the space, because I love the quality over quantity, right? I'm a working dad. I'm in the air traveling 15 days out of the month. Some people would say, oh, you're not um, in, in engaging with your child enough. That works for us, right? You don't get to tell me that. So I think what we need to do is establish what that cost works for family, and it's a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you. Um, this is this is really top of mind for me. We're, we're we're trying to create a housing authority for the church in LA to create 10,000 units in 10 years. So housing affordability is really at the top of my mind right now. But one thing I think it is very expensive to to live in LA. It's it's really expensive to live anywhere. But again, it comes down to sacrifices and what you constitute as quality fatherhood, right? I, my experience is unique in that I, I do wish my dad would have focused a little bit more on the providing than on the nurturing side. And I also do feel that, again, fathers, just like they need to forgive themselves if they work a lot, they also need to forgive themselves for taking time to recalibrate. I, I love that you said that, but also recalibrate professionally, mm -hmm. right? Am I better served working three jobs or am I better serve working one, we may struggle for a little bit, but I go get a vocational certificate or a vocational degree. Do I want my children to see me learn alongside with them and try to do what's best for our family? It may lead to six months, a year, two years of relative struggle with the intent being long-term, you know, stability for the family, right? It, it's it's expensive, absolutely, but I think also God has provided, us, provided all of us with an abundance of, of abilities and, and, and things to, to be able to make the most of what we do. Also for fathers, there's a lot of pride that needs to be swallowed in working with your spouse and partner and taking it as a team approach. When we launched, when we launched our firm, my wife carried us for the first two years, and my kids know that. It was just part of how we took it as a team effort. So there's a lot of... Um, forgiving oneself and also looking inward and saying, am I being the most efficient with what I can do for my family right now, right? Thank you. Yes, really, uh, um, you know, I really love the, the last part of what you said is that my kids know that. And I think that's where a lot of our stressors come in is that we don't communicate with our kids and say, look, here's the sacrifice we're gonna make for the family. Here's what that's gonna look like and we wanna, to have you as part of that journey. Uh, everything that goes on uh, in terms of what we're aspiring toward in our family, like we have real discussions with our son 
Uh, I make sure that he's included in my creative process and, hey, son, what do you think about that? So he has some agency in who his dad is out in the world. So he knows if he's like, yo, dad couldn't come to this, but he's at this thing, um, I know what he's doing. And then there's the trade-off. There's just moments where, you know, there, there are real trade-offs and that you have to be okay with making that sacrifice and giving up that other thing for the most important thing, which is being there for your child. You know, when I think about my dad, you know, as I look back, my dad met my mom. She had three kids. Uh, they went on to have three. And then when they separated, he remarried. My stepmom had three. So in total, he's raised nine children. And my dad has never skipped a beat with the basics. Like we've never went without lights, we never went without heat and things like that, but we went without a lot of the things that we wanted as kids. What's really fascinating to me now, when I reflect back on my childhood, there is one material thing that I remember my dad getting in my whole childhood. And it was, it was, it was the first pair of Jordans. Um, <laughs> and, the only reason I remember him getting them is because I destroyed those things in like two weeks. I literally thought I was like Mike on the court. And uh, my dad was like, okay, I, I see what you're doing there. And he went and bought me a knockoff pair of Jordans. Um, and we, went, we, we, we battled for a whole summer over whether I would wear those knockoff Jordans. And so I have a deep memory of that experience. But what I, what I remember the most is my dad worked overtime. He did Air Force Reserves on the weekend. I remember when he and I would go to lunch. I remember when my dad would at least once a week get up and make me breakfast, even though he was dogged tired. So that quality time is what I remember the most uh, from my childhood in terms of feeling taken care of. It was in, in those moments, and so, you know, it's, it's always gonna be a trade-off. You know, mothers make trade-offs, dads make trade-offs. I think how we position it is probably more problematic than actually having to do it because we kind of elevate the idea of the dad who works himself to death, dies at an early age, but the family has the pride of saying that that man was a provider. Um, and I think that's where the trade-off is at, is that we can soften that blow um, by really adding some of these other elements and some of these other interpretations of how we show up as dads and men. And, it, and it, you don't have to make a, a real trade-off financially because, uh, you know, if you're out here in L.A., you got to go get it. You know, mm -hmm. but the dope thing about L.A. is that, you know, as a parent, you have access literally most of the year around to actually get out and do things that are cost-efficient. You know, and that's really actually fun. It's not like you have to spend a ton of money to spend that time in a fun and imaginative way. So what I would say to dad is like increase your imagination, um, you know, uproot some of the old ideas of what it means to be a parent. Think of more innovative ways to spend time with your kids. It's like, you know, we got to be innovative when we're dating. We got to be innovative when we're in a deep relationship to get quality time. That same intentionality if applied to childhood and child rearing definitely produces like incredible, um, uh, you know, returns on investment. Thank you so much. That we definitely um, appreciate everything that's been done, said, and done today. We have a and this now. I'm going to tell you now. This is the the teacher coming back in me. <laughs> this answer has to be brief, but it's powerful. You talked about quality, not quantity. So I'm going to flip it. This is definitely quality. Okay. So our last question, because I do want to give the audience members an opportunity to ask a few questions, and I know people are hungry. There's some lunches that they'll be taking on the way out. But my last question for you all is, um, author Frank Pittman once wrote, fathering is not something perfect men do, but something that perfects the man. What do you enjoy the most about your fatherhood journey, and what gem would you share with a young father struggling currently? and quality, not quantity. And whoever wants to start, Ryan will start you on your end. You look at me, I go to Shaka, man. I've learned, you know, they say there's no expert leaders, there's no expert parents, but I feel like there's always studying leaders, studying parents, and I've learned a lot just from being in the green room and then on the stage with, with these men here. Um, I don't know, my daughter just makes me a better person. I just. 
There's, it's pretty simple. Yeah. Thank you. Make sure you tell her that. <laughs> she tells me that. <laughs> <laughs> I think you guys got a theme of what my house is like. It sounds as if you're all raising very um, powerful kids who are empowered to speak and use their voice, which is a wonderful thing. Next. Dr. Gray, since we're going this way. Yeah, I would say in my journey in parenting, it's raising kids who value me. Right? I hear my kids all the time say, my daddy don't play, but I have no doubt that he loves me unconditionally. Right? Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Unconditional love, thank you. Rodrigo. I would say, uh, as a man of faith, it's, it's the closest I can come to understanding how God views us in being a parent the good and the bad. And the one thing that I would throw out there, because it happened with me and my dad, is that I all, I'm always present to the fact that my kids are judging me as a father now. They will one day judge me as a man, too. So I'm always very cautious of how, what I'm doing outside of fatherhood, too, because the judgment goes both ways. Yeah. Thank you. That's powerful. Yeah, for me, it's just a great conversation. There's nothing like talking politics with an 11-year-old who <laughs> thinks they got it all figured out. Um, and then just discovering that the music that he's been exposed to since a child, hearing him randomly humming Marvin Gaye and Stevie Wonder and beatboxing Eric B. and Rakim, just brings me great joy. Well, thank you. Thank you for everything you've shared here today. Let's give them all a round of applause. We're going to ask if we have any questions from the audience. Um, I'm thankful to be the CEO and president of St. Anne's Family Services because the work we do impacts and changes lives for generations to come. And it's not just a tagline, it's real. And everything that you've talked about, our staff and our team members and, and also people, in, we will take back and utilize in our uh, work because it's important that we continue to retool and re-strategize and meet people where they're at. So if someone has a question, we have individuals who have microphones that will come to you. So please raise your hand. I see a question over here. Um, Thank you all. This was beautiful. Do you mind standing up because we want to see your beautiful face? Thank you. All right. um, hello. Quick question because um, it was coming to my mind as far as like what a man is. Like we know kind of what a woman is and what we do as women. We bear children. We give the nurturing phase of it. But um, I feel like I've come across situations where like at 18, you know, they think that they're men at 25, but or even when they become a father, they, they feel like they're a man. But I feel like there's steps or initiations to becoming a man that could be useful to uh, help for myself for sure, but just understanding what that looks like because the age has changed um, as far as what responsibilities it is to be a man. So I'm just, that was clear. So just to, so just because I want to make sure you're saying that manhood changes with time in different ages and different responsibilities. You want to make sure, is there a question or just really more just giving that in fight? That because kind of was the question, like, yeah. just to understand, um, is a man 18? Mm. A woman becomes a woman usually when, she, okay. when she has a period, I guess, or, you know, it seems like she could become that mother at that age and she kind of has to deal with those nurturing mm -hmm. things as a mother that naturally comes in her, but a man, I feel like they have to, some men become men at a very young age, mm -hmm. but that's because they're pushed into it like that, and that's mm -hmm. what society puts them into, but it's not necessarily as clearly defined. Okay. Anybody want to speak to that? Yeah, I would, I would love to respond to that. I think we have the greatest opportunity to restore the innocence of boyhood to this generation. I think far too many boys have been forced into manhood well before they're even capable, like psychologically, like all the data science points to our brains, both male and female brains, aren't fully developed until we're 26. And then we put the onus or responsibility of manhood on boys who are incapable, mostly mentally or psychologically, of navigating the responsibilities and accountability that's required to be a, a man. And so I think there's actually, you know, real inputs that, that you know, have a, a role in the developing man as opposed to being a man. At 18, you're developing into a young man and eventually, you know, if you live long enough, you'll become a man. But I think one, as a society, 
and especially with boys of color, we basically make them adults feel well before they're even capable. You know, you hear the dads on this panel, it's like, I don't want my son in a hoodie. I don't want, and it's not because it's a bad thing, it's because the reality is somebody external can see them as an adult male threat and end their life early. And so that's a cultural thing that we all have to work on and a societal thing. So, you know, to me, I think manhood comes with some responsibility. I told my, my son that, you know, in order to actualize what it means to be a man, you gotta first build something to completion. And so I think part of my strategy is like over time is having him actually build things and fix things so he understands what it means to actually have a career, what he understands what it means to have a family, to be a homeowner. If you can't complete a simple task, you're incapable of handling the responsibility uh, that's gonna be required of you as a father and as a man. Thank you. I would just, a, oh, I'm sorry, ahead. I would just add, you know, I, have, I have was told I was the man of the house at 12. How in the heck am I going to be the man of the house at 12? But in my community, I hear it a lot, when, especially when there's no father in the house. So I start, what did I start to do? Try to help my mama take care of the house since I'm the man of the house. But then I didn't get to be a, an adolescence. I didn't get to be a young man. Those things that I would have, should have been experiencing at that age, I didn't. And so when I got turned 18 and I left the house, I started being a little boy. And now it was time to be a man, right? We have to allow space for young men to be young men and stop telling them that they're men before they're not. But our society tells us that we are. And that's yeah, big they, shocker that boys yeah. are more or less uh, mature than girls at certain ages. Um, but I'll say this, you know, it, it's also generational, I think, um, where our dads were very tough on us, very hard on us. It was, you're 18, you're out of the house, you're either in school or you are you get a job and you're out of the house. And now you see more boys, and I hear this society, I don't know what, what, what they call it, but it's more or less like, oh, well, we've snipped these boys so you know, young that you know, they're gonna be living in their parents' basements for, you know, until they're 30. I'm like, well, in California, we don't have much basements, but. <laughs> You know, I, I do see that, you know, and I make jokes, but my wife, my daughter's on a swim team and I see some of the boys from the swimming, uh, the um, opposing teams and I'm like, soft, soft. But that's just me as is my generation is like, I, you know, and I'm sure that my dad and our dad said the same thing about us. Um, but I do think that they are a lot younger now than they were when we were 18. And I can only say I'm 44, but you know, I, I could say that um, we're not forcing, most of the time, we're not forcing our sons to be men quicker. So I would say, like I tell my daughter, if you're gonna get married, you wait until that guy's about 35 years old and he's got his, you know, he's got his stuff together, so. Thank you. Is there another question? I believe there was another one. And just say your okay. name, please. My name is Adrienne. Um, my question is specifically to LA County. What do you each think could be the biggest systemic change that could help improve fatherhood? Partnerships. Yeah, for me, it's one word. It's just partnerships, right? Um, we can't, from housing to legal services to mental health to um, parenting uh, education, um, I don't think our systems connect enough to provide these young men with the tools to parent in the way that they need to. I would say it's accountability. I think that there were some, some questions here, you know, about we do need our young men and our boys to be um, better communicators, uh, more open to having, you know, intimate conversations but we also can't take away the element of the fact that they are going to be men and they do need to be held accountable that they may need to be the sole provider and they may need to be a father and a worker and a husband. And maybe that starts at the educational level, maybe it starts at providing fair housing for everyone, but I think there is an element, there is a risk in not holding our boys accountable into being at a, at a, various, at a varying degree of, of, of manhoodness, right? Um, I, I think, I praise God for the childhood I had because it made me who I am today. There's some things that I wouldn't want my son to be, to go through, 
but I also lament the fact that he's not going to go through them, you know. And I think a lot of guys feel excluded when I said that 18 months to nine years old because the 18 months is, you know, the child just is really attached to the mom. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the that men just get, I guess, pushed out of the way, not not consciously maybe, but then they start, you know, separating themselves even more than being accountable for, you know, um, raising a human being. Um, and I, I, I think that's something that, should be changing, but I think it's something that guys tend to say, well, the kid doesn't need me, and then by three years old, well, really attach their mom, five years old, well, I'm working too much, and then it just becomes a prolonged excuse. So, like I said, my wife just holds me more accountable, I guess, but, you know, it's always, it's, but we need to hold, to his point, men more accountable early on as the child is, um, is growing. So what I'll say, because we're at time, is that as I'm hearing everything that you're saying, one of the philosophies that we utilize, oh, there's another question, okay. I'm sorry, we're gonna get your question, but I'm gonna add to this because Annette, my wrap up will be your, your, your question, is that we have a philosophy here of high support and high accountability. The team knows we talk about, that's where I lead from a place of high support and high accountability. And I think when you talk about accountability for the father, the high support has to go along. Encourage them every time they're doing the right thing. Catch them doing right. Share and encourage. You know, you're a young man, I never forgot, there was a young man that rode his 10-speed bicycle with diapers and formula every Friday when he got paid from his job at McDonald's. And we made such a big deal. He ended up actually becoming a single dad for his, that boy down the line. But it's important that we make sure that we give them those kudos and encourage and meet them where they're at. Sir, your name please and yes. your question. Hello, I'm gonna stand over here so that my back is toward the wall. Uh, my name is Roger Williams. I'm a pastor, an elder, minister, humanitarian. And so when I look out into a community to a certain extent, uh, I have a responsibility for everyone I see, okay? And so this really kind of um, connects to this, this matter of accountability. My question is, where do you draw the line? When we talk about the cost of fatherhood, where do you draw the line when it, everyone looks at you when you are a responsible father, everyone looks at you as being their dad too. Or saying, I wish my dad were more like your father, right? You were with your friends. Where do you draw the line? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, I, actually, I actually love it. I always tease my son. I'll be like, man, I'm going to be like the coolest dad. Like all your friends going to love me when you like irritated with me. Um, <laughs> But I, but I think, it, you know, it's tough. You know, you, you, you meet these kids, and, I'm, you know, I meet a lot of kids that come from those kind of hard, scrabble backgrounds. You want to love one all of them. You want to protect them, and you want to be able to give them all the support that you give your own child. And, you know, the reality is, like, we only have so much capacity. Um, so what I try to do is make sure that I'm refueling so I can actually give more. Um, I make sure that I align myself with other incredible dads so I can actually call on them more. Uh, incredible men, some who aren't dads, who are just willing to lean in. You know, one of my greatest, you know, accomplishments is that my friendship circle are just incredibly dope dads. And I can call them in any region in the country and be like, hey, I got this kid, needs a little bit more support. Can you build something ar around that? Um, and then we also take care of each other. And I think that's, that's what, uh, you know, my point earlier was like, we got to take care of our boys, we got to hold them accountable. We also got to take care of them and give them space. Uh, and that's really what a lot of those kids, when they're like, man, I wish my dad was like you, or I wish, it's because oftentimes when we're mentoring, we're mentoring with seeing the best outcomes of them. And we're giving that love and that grace and that thoughtfulness and that attention for them to communicate in a safe space. And you know, to me, that really allows them to be boys, uh, but also holds them accountable. So lean into that circle, I mean, you got, uh, four gentlemen up here. I'm sure we're all figure out ways to support and be supported. You know, I can't, I, you know, realistically speak for the time, but I just get a sense from a character standpoint that there's many men in this room like that who's looking for other ways to lean in. So 
just lean in that circle and, and spread the, the love out. Thank you. It speaks back to Dr. Graves' statement about partnership because that's what you're talking about is a partnership. So thank you for your questions. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for supporting you know, the work that we do. I appreciate your being here. And um, we're going to continue to do this work. We have not left our work with mothers and children. That is still what we do. But we recognize that this is also a part of what's necessary for support. And thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for being here and being transparent. Um, everybody here has shared something that is going to impact a life. And I call Shaka the evolutionary, not the revolutionary, the evolutionary, because that evolution everyone has access to, and that's why I asked that question. Everyone can evolve, Dr. Graves, everyone, Rodrigo, Ryan, everyone has a chance to evolve. So thank you so much.